in um, service then as part of West Wirral, we're saying we would offer a walk-in option for um, a paediatric service up to 19 because recognising that a lot of parents were going up to A&E with children and um, waiting in A&E for, for things they absolutely could have seen, could have walked in urgently and seen a GP for. So we're offering a walk-in element um, within West Royal for, for paediatric services not to 19. But then recognising the key reasons people use the walk-in centre from an adult perspective, we're, we're looking at the ongoing dressing and wound care being bookable rather than walk-in. So if you um, are at home and you um, have a serious burn, um, you would go up to the urgent treatment centre, have that sorted, and then for any ongoing um, dressing changes or stitches removed or anything like that, um, then you would be able to go to a, a local facility to have that, 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 that those things then carried out for you. So the local offer is access to GP appointments, a local service, a building which I'm going to come on to now, that would offer bookable appointments for things like wound care and a walk-in, as well as a bookable urgent appointment for, for children 0 to 19. In terms of where those services are based, we have not, deliberately have not said where we think they should be. One of the questions in the consultation is to ask what's important to people about where we cite that local provision, that local base. And those are things like parking, accessibility, etc., transport, those sorts of things. And we will really analyse the feedback we get to come up with a sensible, um, sensible option. We're also giving an open comment section for people um, who might want to put forward where they believe if there's a particular building that you would want us to be using, that's an NHS building, um, you might want to put forward those ideas. So we generally have made no decisions at all about where those buildings are cited, other than we're saying we would want a local facility in West Wirral for that local development. The GP appointments um, wouldn't necessarily be in your own GP practice, they would be working across West Wirral, so the extra appointments, eight to late seven days, would be available within a reasonable locality, local area, so all, all within West Wirral. Um, apologies, because I know this slide is really difficult to see from the layout of the room and people at the back. I'm going to just leave that up before I just finalise what the next steps are. But that, that slide attempts to show, there are copies of the presentation at the back, uh, attempts to show the current services down the left hand side. Um, the middle column shows the proposed model and then the right hand side shows the increased offer. So it, it, it really tries to clarify the things that I've just said around the 111, the pharmacy, the, the enhanced primary care, the walking for children and the urgent treatment centre. So hopefully you start to see that we're trying to generally actually give you an improved service. Financially, there is no new money other than what has been provided nationally for the extra GP appointments. So our challenge is how we do this within the existing cost envelope. But I absolutely want to stress that this is not about cutting funding at all. This is um, genuinely about what's the current spend in Wirral on urgent care and working within that same cost envelope, but getting a better service. Recognising that we've got to develop an urgent treatment centre for the reasons I've described means that we cannot have the current offer and an urgent treatment centre because that's just not affordable. So we've generally tried to listen to people about what was important, what were the issues, and look at the data to come up with the best proposals that we can. I think finally then, in terms of next steps, um, our consultation runs till the 12th of December. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for the public meetings. Very happy to come back to this constituency meeting if that's, if that's requested. Um, ways for people to contact us online and questionnaires and so on. And that is all described on our website so you can, you can download documents and we've brought some tonight on, on the back table. Um, at, on the 12th of December, we will be fully analysing all feedback um, any further ideas that you, you, know, you want to make and then we'll work through all that with a final recommendation to governing body in February next year. Um, governing body from the CCG will make the final decision 
um, and then the time scale for any implemented changes, NHSE have asked that local areas develop and implement their urgent treatment centres by December 19, which will soon come around. Um, and we would then, on the back of what, what comes from the public, look at an appropriate implementation plan and then work very hard around the communication. And just a final comment from me, just to say that we do have some working groups working in parallel to the consultation, looking at some of the issues um, and working those through as we go. One of them might be less of an issue here, maybe not, don't make an assumption, is, is on transport. So for example, when we're looking at South Wirral, actually have we got the right bus routes, etc., the transport right. So really important that we hear from all the localities the particular issues that we can take away and do something about. Um, and we're also looking at things like um, the pathway, the communications, all those things. So we are going to be doing a lot of work with councillors, um, with members of the public, with stakeholders um, to work through some of these issues. But just to reassure you, this is a genuine attempt to improve urgent care and we're all recognising that we've all got slightly different opinions and people feel very passionately. Um, so challenging time ahead, but we really want to hear your views and make sure we, we do the best with, with what we've got with resources in we're all for people. Okay, uh, Jackie, thanks very much for that. Just a, a quick hit, because you mentioned the two million for GPs for extending hours of GPs, the extra money that's come in. And, and we just received an additional two million for the uh, winter um, uh, cover, winter the increase in winter demand as well. Absolutely, yeah. nothing yes is escaping. Um, so in the last 48 hours we've had confirmed um, from the government that um, recognising the pressure on social care, um, they've made a 250 million available across the country. For Wirral that works out approximately about 1.8 million, absolutely right. Um, we're waiting for some further detail but that's about supporting having a good safe winter and making sure there's no delayed transfers of care. So it's temporary funding but absolutely will be best used. Lovely, that's good news. Um, there are a number of people, are people content, because we did have a good go on the uh, Green Belt and I think that was a key issue, that we have a, because this I think is really, really important, that we get some questions on this and we're going to have to forego the public question time. So, uh, are people, in order to try and finish round about nine, uh, nine o'clock, are people broadly content with that? Because I've noticed a few hands have come up. So, okay. Um, <coughs> Phil, and then the lady that's indicated that. Yeah, um, when I see words like transformation, accountable, uh, sustainability. What usually goes hand in hand with that is cuts. Now, I am a member of my own uh, patient participation group and I would urge everybody in this room at your practice go and join your patient participation group because there you'll see that your practice managers are on a budget and that budget is pretty tight and they have to make that spread as wide as they possibly can. Um, on the pharmacies, uh, well, I'll, I'll do the walk-in centres. Can you, here tonight, categorically assure everybody in the room that none, none of those walk-in centres are going to close? Because I notice up there you've got walk-in centres times three. I don't know what that means. But um, will you say that they are not going to, going to close? On the CCGs, the policy of a CCG, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you have doctors, nurses, all the rest of it, and you're supposed to have a lay person on that group. And the CCG meetings I've been to, I've never seen a lay person on that group yet. Um, coming to the pharmacies, and you're saying about people going to these different pharmacies, if you go into a pharmacy and, and the, the pharmacist says, can I just have a word with you about your prescription and it takes you into a little room. When that happens, they go and charge your practice £28 or whatever that, that cost is. So there's another cost going to your manager who is already struggling on a budget. So where, if you are going to close 
these walking centres, where does that help uh, the A&Es when they're already under pressure? Okay, I'll, I'll try and respond and cover, <laughs> and cover those points. If I miss one, please come back I, to me. Sorry, just before you do that, because otherwise we might be able to bundle up because there were a number of people who indicated. The lady, the lady there who indicated. Sorry, yes. Do you want to, is there a microphone for sorry. you? So, um, I just want to worry about staffing levels at the moment can't cope with the pressure that we're under. So, if we increase that to having um, more walk, say, a, a special centre at our park, where is the staff going to come from? Is that staff going to come from the walking centres that are already around now to manage? Or are there going to be new staffing? Because we haven't got enough sufficient staff to cope with what we've got now. And if you increase that or you centralise it, what happens to the staff? And that's my concern. The paediatric department at Arrow Park is, is very, very busy. I work on the children's ward at Arrow Park and we are over, we've got more patients than we have staff at the moment. And I can't see how you can improve that without a, spending more money, increasing more staff and, you know, and, and training. Probably. I think there was one more person that indicated that they wanted to ask a question, or was I mistaken? Yes, Peter. I'm, 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 no, it's okay. I'm, I'm very interested in what happens. I mean, this is a new plan. This is a new requirement. I'm very interested in what's happening at the moment. I mean, we talked about 50,000 <coughs> people attending A&E. It's being, I don't know whether you call it trivial, but could, could be within a couple of hours. We're effectively wasting huge amounts. What are you doing about that at the moment? Because it seems to me if you could reduce that by half, down to 25%, then you would make a huge leap forward <coughs> in terms of what you're doing this process. The other thing I'm really interested in is about the, um, the 111 idea, where you seem to be oper oper operating a sort of triage type of arrangement, where instead of using level one support, you lose a level three support to determine what's wrong and then pass the problem on to somebody who can actually deal with it, whatever level they're at, or whether it's a brain surgeon or whether it's someone who's going to apply a sticky plaster or give advice that they should go home, rest, drink plenty of water. <laughs> If I could deal with that, that question, those couple of questions first, if that's okay. So, um, in terms of the 111, um, that is a national development. Um, NHSE are leading that 111. It's taken account of the learning over the last couple of years because that was a, you know, a new service. And it's a genuine attempt to actually improve the patient experience and outcomes. So what, what we do know from the 111 current offer is that many people have fed back and we can see it from the data about where people end up and what the outcomes are. Many people are waiting for a phone back, many people get fed up a bit and just turn up at A&E instead of waiting. Um, people don't end up always with a really good outcome. For example, some people can, ha can actually have a phone diagnosis with a prescription but could, can't get from that from the current 111. So there's a whole host of issues there. The national development is about, and I, I can't stand here and say it's absolutely this and this is the absolute cost because it's currently being rolled out and developed, but they've got quite a tight time frame on that to finish testing it this year and start to roll out early next. But this has been about um, actually looking at the use of the admin staff with clinical staff. So, so there is some little bit of immediate triage, but you get immediately on that same call to speak to a clinician if you need one. Whereas at the moment you have to wait for a call back and that time can vary tremendously for people. And the intention is that 111 deliver an outcome. Either they can give you advice and it's dealt with or it's a prescription or you're advised and booked into the urgent treatment centre or to a GP. Um, with regards to um, the, the waste around pharmacy, you know, that almost 50% of people ticked up to A&E didn't really need that. I think we have to take on board some of it is about communication as well, but some of it is, is about the current offer that people told us we're really confused. We go to a &E, one, because it's a trusted brand, secondly, we get seen and we're treated, and thirdly, we don't always know where to go or when they're open or it wasn't open. When we've analysed the data, about 20% of people honestly could have been treated from the pharmacist 
and given a prescription and dealt with them and we've not got that communication out well enough for people to know and trust that and a significant number of people could have been dealt with with a GP or a nurse at locally had they had access to one and a big message to us was we don't get access when we need it. So this is an attempt to look at how do we make safe A&E how do we deliver this requirement to have an urgent treatment centre that gives people access in a, in a system to urgent appointments with rapid access to diagnostics as they need them, but also signposting people to the community. So the model I've tried to describe is having an urgent treatment centre with four health and wellbeing hubs that provide walking urgent appointments for children moving the things like the wound dressings to bookable appointments but having same day access to GPs in that locality. Urgent treatment centres being open 24 hours or 15 hours and then A&E freed up for those who absolutely need it and, and they get good quality treatment. Interesting that you said 20% would be treated by a pharmacy. Is there a pharmacy in A&E? Yeah. Yes, there is next door, yes. Well, isn't that sort of part of the answer? Yes, but when you look at the bottom, some of this is about actually, we don't necessarily want for people to have to travel to the A&E no, pharmacies no, no, if they could have gone locally. I understand that. But in the first instance, you've got an immediate problem. Yeah? So you deal with the immediate problem. If the immediate problem can be dealt with by pharmacies, then we've got pharmacy staff, and you've got to find a way of reaching them. Oh, sorry, That's okay. Can we, can we address the, the other question that yeah, someone just indicated they'd like yeah, to? Yeah, Mr Chairman, I know you're keen to wind up the meeting. No, I'm not actually. I was going to tell you something when we, this bit's finished. Is that okay? All right. So, yeah. So, 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 the workforce question, really, really valid observation and comments. And I'm not going to stand here and say we've got all the answers to workforce. It would be really challenging. Part of the working groups that we're looking at, one of them is around workforce and we've already been engaged with the Community Trust and the Acute Trust as well as Primary Care. Um, we know we've got workforce challenges. Um, part of our consideration in the Urgent Treatment Centre is actually about trying to consolidate the more highly skilled staff for those urgent appointments. The consultation transformation is, is absolutely not going to be about any job losses, so we need to reassure people of that. It may be that some nurses may need to work in a slightly different location and there may well need, in fact I'm sure there will be, an opportunity for those who want it to have further training and be upskilled. We've had some initial feedback from staff because we work very closely with the Community Trust and the Acute to brief staff and workforces to, to ensure that they're, they're not just unduly concerned. And actually we've had some really good feedback in the last few days where staff are saying actually we get this we can see there are opportunities, this actually might help some of the workforce challenges where we're dispersed around the Wirral, actually consolidating where those urgent appointments need to be and they've actually welcomed the opportunity to work with us and they're saying they're quite enthused by the opportunity for skilling up for those people who want that. I was just concerned about the cost of the hiring, I don't know how you mean that closing some of the jobs. So if that links with that first question, so I'm going to answer that now. So in terms of being really clear, we are not closing the current walking centre buildings in terms of the services they provide. But what we are doing, bear with me, bear, bear with me, we are saying that we will not be having the walking for adults for urgent appointments that currently exist. What we're saying is the current services in, in places like um, Victoria Central and Eastern, they offer a range of things, including the, possibly, you know, the blood test, the sexual health, etc. There's a whole range of services. None of those are affected, they still continue. However, the urgent element, the urgent care element, which is the walk-in, the ability to walk in when those services are open, to say, I need to see um, a nurse urgently, the walk-in for adults will change, that won't be available. We're saying, 25-ish percent of people as an adult went to the walk-in for dressing and wound care. We'll make that bookable locally. So it won't be a walk-in, it'll just be bookable. And you'll be able to make a quick bookable, but it'll be, it won't be a walk-in at any time. And that's an attempt to try and help you not have to wait hours or duly. Um, so so th those are the bits we're changing, and we're saying that the replacement of the walk-in urgent appointment will be because you will have an 
There will be GP appointments available locally, same day access to see a GP, which at the moment is a big message that says we can't get to see a GP. You can also go to the urgent treatment centre as well, either as a bookable appointment or as a walk-in. So does that, is that, am, I, am I being clear on the change locally? Yeah, but what, what you're saying about the um, walk-in centres, and you're you now saying that uh, it's changing for adults. <coughs> say, for instance, as you just said, on a bandage changing, that, that's going to change. Uh, I want you to definitely say that none of those centres or buildings that provide that facility, none of those facilities are going to close. And the fact that why don't we have a lay person on the CTV? So we have got a lay person. We've had a lay, we've, we've had a lay person working with us on, on this development. So we have, and we've had Health Watch working with us as well. And they're part of the, 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 the steering group that we meet monthly. So we have um, the walking centre buildings themselves. So Victoria Central and Eastern are not closing in terms of the services they provide part of the wider offer, sexual health, blood tests, those types of things. They currently provide, as does the one at Arrow Park, walk-in, also they offer a walk-in option when they are open. So if you, if you believe you have an urgent need, you can walk in. We're saying that element for adults stops. That's a bit out of service about the time. We have had Mother has presented a PCA to the child um, with a wheezy episode, say, to a doctor might just be a wheezy episode. And it was in 10 to 15 minutes of being in the Lincoln Centre, has been blue lighted to our car with an asthma attack and has been quite physically falling. That's happened four times. There's also been adults who have walked in to the PCH as a Lincoln patient with chest pain or feeling unwell. The nurse has spotted them, pale, family sweaty. Blue lines to our heart because it's had a heart attack. If that walking option is taken away at BCH, it's a long way to our heart. So who's, who, where do they go to? Because they don't, they're not bringing 999 because they're going to be ill. They go to the walking centre because they're feeling unwell, because they can't get the quotes to the GP. The nurse assesses them and they straight to our heart. So, so that's the bit I'm going to that initial. So a couple of points on that. Um, the walking centres at the moment are all open different hours and they all offer slightly variation on the theme so there's not a consistent offer for, 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 for people in Wirral. They're not open 24-7. So yes, if you're looking up to be open and you can walk in now, that's fine. But they are a variable option and they're not open as, as you might need them. The walking option for children, we are saying stays because we know that for parents, when we looked at the data, there's two issues for this, is that parents don't, can't always wait for a bookable appointment. They need, they need like, absolutely. But we also know that a significant percentage of people, the parents, turned up to A&E who didn't need to be in A&E. They need to be seen urgently, but didn't need that level. So we're, we're saying that the four localities will offer the walking option for paediatric services, 0 to 19. GP appointments will be available. So there's this £2 million of additional GP appointments, extra 720 appointments a week in Wirral, which is about same day access for urgent appointments. So rather than you walk in and wait, and yes, I absolutely accept if you see you might be blue lighted, but the same way you go to a GP, a GP that's available, and they get you an ambulance quickly as well. So it, it's looking at it in the round. Pharmacy costs. Okay. Um, Okay, I think that's been a really, I'm really pleased we actually have someone who works in the NHS was able to ask those key questions and the way, now you've mentioned that we've got stuff at the back um, for people to respond, so I think that's, we've had a good run around this track in terms of what, what you've been doing, what the intention and so on and so forth. Clearly the most important thing now is for people to respond to that consultation, make sure that it's being considered. And maybe we could ask you back one step. No. So once that's all been considered and you're coming forward with your proposals, would that be it? Delighted to. So, no at all. Does that sound reasonable to people? Yep. Yeah. So well done. <laughs> and having had 
quick chat with colleagues. Um, we're going to try and do um, 15 minutes worth of questions because there are clearly people have come here specifically to ask a question. A couple of people shouted, Shane, come on, you have plenty. <laughs> the, the gentleman in the blue jumper, did you have a, did you have a question? Well, that's what the public question time is. Yes, but you clearly indicated you were closing the meeting at 9 o'clock. I, I asked whether we were going to, but I've changed my mind in the light of people's concerns about that. Is that okay? As, have, as has everybody. So, questions. The lady at the back. Yep. Thank you. Um, David Ball was actually asked here last time to come and discuss the golf course. actually asked here tonight to discuss the golf resort and we were really hoping he'd give us an update so I wonder if we could ask him back again in three months time to see if we can get an update yes yes and yes okay thank you very much um, I submitted a question via email um, as well and it hasn't been printed out sorry so, so did I there's, there's quite a few people, I think, who have submitted questions via email and they've not been printed out. I, if that is the case, and I'm sure it is, I can only apologise for that. Oh, is that, I think that's been circulated. Yeah, they're not, they're not in there. No. Right. So let's get that sorted out. Hopefully, do we take everyone's sort of names and emails and stuff so we can circulate stuff after this? I know it's not helped. Yes, of course you can. So the question is, Ken, of the one that's been answered by David Ball. Right. We have a list of other questions that haven't been answered yet by him. We've all got them on the table and they weren't in the streets. Oh, right. So we've got them and they will be answered. So we've got a question, but not the answers as well. We were under the impression that the questions would be able to be asked tonight. Yes. And councillors would be able to answer them tonight. Is that not correct? No. Okay. There's a couple of points I'd like to make. The, about the, going back to the green belt, um, the council did an actual consultation on the green belt methodology review last December. I think it concluded, actually consulting on the methodology that was going to, to look at the green belt review. Um, it's still the the consultation hasn't been published yet. It, it finished last December. Um, we're, we're still asking to see what the results of that uh, methodology review was and it still hasn't been published as far as I'm aware. So we were just wondering when that was going to be published because all this green belt review is going on and we still don't know what the methodology is. Okay. Alright, I think David has left the David's building. Left, yeah. So, um, so it would have been quite useful to pick that up in the session. You got another question or well, is there it, anybody it, else? It's a similar thing. Um, David mentioned tonight that the, the governments are going to be doing another consultation on the methodology for the housing targets. The last methodology went out for consultation to all the local authorities and Wirral didn't actually bother to respond. So. Um, so we're just wondering if they were bothered to respond to the one that's going to happen this December. Um, and my question tonight was just about the golf resort really because right. It's stated again tonight in the documents that have been released that the council has looked at the golf resource and compared it to other options. Um, they've compared it, they've said that uh, no other scheme measures against the golf resort in terms of positive impact, and the golf resort provides the best return for Wirral across a number of indicators. So they're talking about various measures and various indicators, and they're indicating that they've looked at various other options, but a freedom of information request has now actually found out that they've looked at no other options and yet tonight you're still issuing statements saying that they've looked at other options against other measures and other indicators. So when are you going to stop misleading us and tell us that there are no other options that have been looked at? Well, it all Not directed to you, Darren. Thank you. <laughs> you know how sensitive I am about it. Sure. Can we capture that and make sure that we, we get that picked up because that, that's the end. And so if we can circulate it to those people who've got the details of that would be great. But certainly to, to the, the means to tell those on He's gone to make the board, he will be on. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, Ken. 
It's just handing you. He's handing you the money. Do I take it that the road safety officer will attend the next constituency meetings if it obviously isn't here today? He is. He's just handing you the money. Okay. Can we have some input on the heaven road safety issue, please? Yeah. Okay. So, is it going to be the road heaven road safety? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is um, there a question? Yeah. yeah, I received a letter in May earlier this year from the uh, good gentleman there, Mr. Reese, road safety officer, who said that Heron Road does not meet the criteria for a fixed speed camera based on its comparatively good road safety record. Now as you can see from the turnout from the Heron Road residents here tonight, I'm sure none of them would agree with you. We've had more accidents in the residential area. We've got speeds of 60 mile an hour in a 30 mile an hour limit. And I'm sure that there's no other road on the Wirral where you will get this. Where there's a road, let me finish please Mr Chairman, um, where you have such high speed in a 30 mile an hour limit. So what we would like to say is, would the council give us their backing for um, a fixed speed camera? Now we know it's not you guys that made the decision, it's the police, but would you be kind enough to make a recommendation? Okay. David, do you want to give us an update? Because we've had two questions about how we're going. Thank you. Um, Heron Road has, during the last five years, um, has seven collisions recorded by the police. Same rules right. apply as we tried to use in the Yes, yeah. sorry, Kenzie. Uh, for every collision where somebody is injured, uh, there's a requirement that the drivers have to report that to the police. That information is the information that is statutorily required and what local authorities up and down the country use to determine relative priorities. And it's also the information that is uh, used to determine whether or not speed counts are appropriate. And that requires a number of uh, more serious injuries. Uh, so those uh, crashes where people sadly died or those where they are technically seriously injured. Serious injuries are the definition, broken bones, open accidents in hospital, severe bleeding, life threatening shock. Um, within the 40 mile an hour, the rural section, which is twisty, um, has no frontage, that is the area that has got seven collisions within the last five years. And of those, one was uh, somebody who was over the drink drive limit. Another one was um, being pursued by the police and then lost control. Uh, so some of these are not things that we can solve by the introduction of speed cameras as a, as a measure to do that. I think you're calling with safety cameras. Speed cameras, yeah, I'll go with that. Safe, speed safety cameras. Yeah. Um, within the 30 mile an hour section of Heron Road, we, are, we have no evidence from the police around injury-related crashes. And I know that for every... When I started doing this work 30-something long time years ago, government said that there were a, a number, no, an estimated number of non-recorded collisions for every one that it was. And that was about six. And over the years, that's increased. And government now suggests that's around about 17. However, we've still got uh, an evidence base of last year, some 437 crashes where people were hurt on will in one year. And I think we need to focus the money that we have uh, and the effort that we have to reducing ongoing problems like that. And I don't doubt, and it's a really difficult discussion I have with people at times, uh, in the future there may be an, another injury collision. And I don't want that on Heron Road. But we've got a weight of evidence on other roads 
which means that they become a priority. And it's a difficult choice in, in making that. So there are some things that we can do on Heaven Road. Uh, we were asked at the previous constituency committee if we have a look at putting no entry signs. That's taken a lot longer than we thought would be possible, but it is coming. Uh, there is a start date for that on the recommencing the 15th of October. We've had all sorts of problems because we've uh, had a termination of our existing contractors. We've now sourced the signs and all those kinds of things. So that's kind of cool. Um, we've had a look at the maintenance of the road. And one of the issues that was raised was around the, uh, the, the tarmac on the road and the noise that that then generates for residents nearby. Love to resurface it with a nice quiet road surface, that would be nice. But the council doesn't have a limitless pot of money to do roads resurfacing. Uh, we spend a lot of money for these potholes. We don't want to just be reactive, so there are programmes that go ahead where highway maintenance, based on conditions survey, prioritises funding for roads resurfacing. And some people will see it um, around where we uh, tar over and chip over surfaces, and that provides a, a sealing product for a lot for quite a while uh, and extends the life of the road surface. At the moment, Heron Road doesn't meet that um, uh, level for intervention. I'm sorry, but we don't have the uh, sums of money that we would need to do that at present, but we will continue to uh, um, inspect the road on a regular basis uh, and put that forward when it meets that level. And I think all members will have long lists of roads in their areas where they say people would like it to be resurfaced and we can't get around to the north. Um, there are some edgy carriage and marker posts and things that we can and should replace them and put in as part of the safety scheme and I've had conversations with maintenance colleagues to get them shifted to get more of those things replaced and put in. Um, I've looked at how we can uh, intervene with sort of more medium term measures uh, and I think the vehicle activated events warning signs within the rural so uh, section, the 40 mile an hour section, because that's where the crashes are actually happening. Uh, but we need to find a funding stream for those and that's something in the order of 10 to 12,000. I don't have that 20 to 12,000 for that priority at the moment, uh, but I'm looking to see how we can develop that as part of uh, future transport for growth and funding for road safety measures. Um, and longer term, the road needs a more major scheme, which I'm not going to go there with the detail of that because that's a whole bunch of unknowns uh, from there. I would say to the residents of, uh, of Harry Mode, I understand and have lived, I don't currently live in a road that, that has the speed uh, levels that you've got. I did live in a road where people were driving uh, inordinately quickly. There is, we can't expect a problem to be there all the time. Uh, we've discussed the issue of speed cameras with Merseyside Police. Um, it's not meeting the criteria. Uh, there isn't somewhere that they can put a camera van or a speed camera within the rural 40 mile an hour bit. Um, so, at the moment, the answer to that is no, but you can help. Uh, you can help by joining Community Speed Watch, uh, and uh, unfortunately, one of the, um, the officers, an ex-traffic sergeant from the Seaside Police, have come on to describe how that's working across the world now, and how we're trying to reinvigorate that programme. And I will, I've got some information uh, if it's here, if residents would love to get involved with that, because it it does have an impact on driver speeds. Okay. May I respond to that quick briefly? No. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Andrew to say a few words and then we'll have one more round and then we move on. I don't want it to become a personal conversation that could actually be had outside. So, Andrew, if you've got something to say, then we'll uh, have one more round and move on. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm Andrew Gardine, Board Councillor for Bobby Melton and Heron Road is probably uh, the biggest issue in Melton, I would say, by the way, it is the biggest issue. And I think the, correct me if I'm wrong, residency, to speak out, the issue, whilst appreciating the rural section has its dangers, the real issue here is um, the residential section, where there is much um, uh, speed. 
does result in low levels of, of low seriousness of accidents, you know, click wing mirrors, as I say. I think, from my perspective and the residents, it's only a matter of time before an innocent, basically, we have a very nasty accident with an innocent person, we're talking to children, we're talking elderly people, because of the speeds in that section, because of people coming off the rural section. And basically, sometimes it can be um, a very nice sort of driving road for people who want to you know, enjoy their driving and come and shoot them through and they don't really appreciate it. So, I appreciate the way risk assessment works, it's likely the time severity. But I think the point the residents are making and I'm making is that there's so much likelihood down there of a low level accident, it is only a matter of time before an innocent falls victim to what would otherwise normally just happen as a low level accident. And that is the real issue. And the other thing I'd like to say, there is a 30, a solar power 30 mile an hour speed limit. Um, sorry. I don't think that works. So, as an initial, something we can take away tonight for sure. Can we get that back to Yes, we'll hold that first Well, and again, I think there's a general consensus, and I know the, the residents of Harrow have turned up at every meeting, and, and do give this a good go, but it does strike me as, and I know you've tried to uh, come forward with a series of you know, small interventions, but I think there is a, that I think, and we did have constituency, road safety um, recommendations to come forward, they were able to come forward. Um, I think we should have um, another go at seeing if there is something we can do to tackle those quite specific concerns around around this, uh, this issue. We, we talked about it time and time and time again, I'm sure everyone A is getting fed up of asking the questions and B hearing them and C answering them. So can we please see if there is something that we could actually do? And if it's a question of just accessing funding streams, let's find out which of those funding streams that need to be accessed and if we can be creative around finding those. We've got Stuart as the Highways uh, Cabinet member. He's heard all these discussions and I'm sure he would be as interested as everyone else as we evolve, as we saw it. Ken, I'm not we've well, done this. I we have, have my first question because Ken. I, thought, I thought the officer was well, meant to be in front okay. of me. So well, I would actually I would actually like to make one. Well question. can you I ask this lady because you indicated you had a question and this lady's been sitting quietly waiting to ask her question. Please. Is it on her own, in which case I'm quite Yes it, it is. It is it is um, to good work. What, um, I'd like to raise quite a simple issue. I mean, there are people here who live off Heron Road, um, so Acres Road and the roads, roads going off Acres Road. Um, the issue for us is we are right on the bend where the bend again finishes and the 30 mile an hour um, comes in. And as you exit Heron, um, Acres Road onto Heron Road, Looking right, it's very difficult to see if cars are approaching. That um, the sign that lights up was actually helpful because you could tell if a car was coming that was over the speed limit because it would light up. But that's not been working for months. Years. What? No, months. Sorry, it's months. Okay, no, I wrote about the last year. Okay, well, this is, I live there and, and you go out of that, that exit all the time. So, the other suggestion, because it's not just about accidents, it's not just about collisions, there are elderly um, drivers who live there who are so fearful about going on, and we have no other option, we have to exit onto that road.